I point out Hidalin because Hidalin, I think, and very few people know this, Hidalin is part of, should be part of the Philippine Sports Commission uh, role because, as you can see, in 2000, the Philippine Sports Commission had a Thailand identity program. And like I said, of going in full circles, the head of this Thailand identity program is Ms. Joy Reyes. I was the medical director of the Philippine Center for Sports Medicine, and Joy Reyes was the head of our sports sociology unit. And we had an idea, uh, Commissioner Tisa Abundo uh, was very supportive on having the Philippine Sports uh, Identification Program. The, the idea then was to go around, we worked with the uh, we worked with the Department of Education, Dex uh, Department of Education and Sports. That's why sports was integral to our education system. And I think it should be integral again to the education system. We actually, we had a team going around uh, the country, measuring the athletes, their anthropometric measures, some of their physiologic measures, and then we put it in a booklet. And this booklet we spread around through the Department of Education uh, 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 physical education department. Now, because physical education is not integral part of, of, of uh, our educational system, I don't know how we, we would do this if this thing happens again. Now, one of the people that was pointed out with this testing manual was a small uh, skinny girl down south. I remember some wanga. And it, she stood out, I think, in one of the Palaro or our national competition. She stood out and we, we were able to uh, take note of her because she fitted some of the anthropometric measures in this testing manual. I actually forgot that until Mark Velasco, Mark then was head of my strength and conditioning program at Philippine Sports Commission, reminded of me, reminded me that we did actually identify Hidalin then. And I told him to go to Sambuanga and look at this girl and see how promising she is. And from then on, uh, Chairman Ramirez was already the chairman once we identified her, uh, supported her in China, and the rest is history. But to produce her medal in 2016, it took about 16 12 to 16 years. That's how long it will take to produce an Olympic medalist. And my point is science should always be backing that. Um, Kindlin right now is not yet qualified for the Tokyo Olympics, but, but I think uh, that's because qualifying tournaments have been canceled because of the COVID situation. But I think all she has to do is participate in the one qualifying tournament, and she will be qualified for the uh, Tokyo Olympics. Hopefully, uh, she wins the gold in Tokyo. Again, uh, this is a program that I think the Philippine Sports Commission should be proud of. This is uh, Hidalin, uh, her silver in Rio. Again, let me point out, to produce this gold medal, uh, this silver medal in the Olympics, it took about 12 to 14 years. So it's not that easy. That's why for those people listening into this uh, summit, you have to start now. And there is no instant gratification. It will be hard work. There'll be some successes, a lot of pitfalls. But if you do your best, I think we can produce a lot more medal winners. El Presidente was my idol. She, he just said I was his idol. El Presidente is my idol. He, he, he would be one of my top uh, basketball players, not just in the Philippines, but in Asia, and at that time, probably in the world. Uh, the problem then is uh, sports was very regional. There was no social media. Uh, TV coverage is very slow, but very low. So uh, the, the efforts and the achievements of athletes weren't that known. 
Uh, my advantage is because of my positions, I've been able to travel all over the world. And I would say uh, Commissioner Mon Fernandez will be one of the most uh, skilled basketball players that we've ever, the world has ever produced. Now, let me remind you, science changes. What I knew, like I said, what I knew in 1991 is very different from what I know now. And you have to be uh, at par with those changes. You have to keep learning. You, you cannot uh, be anecdotal. Unfortunately, in the country, most of our coaching is anecdotal. What worked for me or what worked for my coach will work for the next generation. But remember, athletic skills are always uh, uh, honed. Athletic achievement will always change. And you have to keep with those changes. There's always been a, a discussion on whether athletes are born or whether they are made. I believe athletes are born, but then you have to make them great. That's why in our situation, we will have fantastic basketball players from dating nila ng grade school, high school. Pag college, okay pa sila. Pero pag after college, because they were not made great and they were just relying on their plain innate athletic ability, they will never be great. Okay, so you have to choose which athlete and sana by pure luck that you make them go into the sport that will make them great. And that's why I think a good talent identification program which the Philippine Sports Commission already started and I think this, this summit is part of it again. And I, I, I hope we are making these athletes great. In your position, though, you have to be always informed on the advances of sports science. How do you keep yourself informed? You have to expose yourself. You have to expose yourself uh, in the normal world, go around attending conferences, or in the COVID world, you have the websites and you have the journals. You have to be very careful though. The internet is not regulated. So you will see a lot of trash being set on the internet. And you have to be very particular on which you follow. You have to follow websites that, that are ethical, websites that have been proven. You have to find journals that are uh, have been proven and that are, are peer reviewed. Right now in the medical world, we have what we call predatory journals where they actually publish your articles if you pay them. And you have to be careful that you don't fall victim to these predatory uh, studies. And once you get into the training of athletes, always remember there will always be room for improvement. So in my opinion, we have a great athlete in Paeng Nepomuceno who's lauded it in, in, in uh, bowling. I, I think he just was a great, a good athlete who went into a sport that fit him so well. And so he became a great athlete. And to me, he's our world-class athlete, bar none. These are what uh, we, we suggest for the protein, fat, carbohydrates, and micronutrients. Now, I'll miss... Understanding among coaches is dapat may vitamins ang athletes natin. Dapat bigyan natin sila ng vitamins. That's not that important. Kung maganda ang, ang diet ng athlete nyo, and that's why we have the Philippines Sports Commission uh, Center for where they eat. Kung maganda ang, ang, ang diet ng athlete nyo and well-proportioned and it's, it, they're good from good sources. Extraordinary vitamins are not needed. However, you will have cases na an athlete sweats more. So probably you give him more sodium or you give him more magnesium or an uh, athlete is more prone to, to cramps because of dehydration or because of over, overheating. Then probably you can give him a little more calcium. But in general, you don't need vitamins as long as your diet is good. Uh, a nutrition uh, 
lecture would be more specific in that. But I just want to point that out because when I left PSC in 2007, some people in sports then were insisting that we give a lot of budget to buying vitamins for our athletes, which I think was wrong. I think we should have put those budget in more productive things rather than buying them vitamins. It will help. There's no harm. But I think the benefit ratio is not worth it. Just give them a good diet. When we time their nutrition, and this has been what, what uh, I think is universally accepted, if they wake up at 7 o'clock and sleep at 11 o'clock, you will have your breakfast, lunch, dinner at these times. And I think this is the basis of the meal times in, in the PSC canteen. Uh, this also considers people who work, and people who go to school. And then important, because they work out, you will also order them snacks at this certain uh, times, which is 10 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and right before bedtime. Uh, this is just a general uh, outline. Uh, you can play with it. and. Hopefully, uh, you'll find individual preferences with a healthy diet and healthy lifestyle. When you consider nutrients, you have to consider the pre, the during, and the post of, of feeding your athlete. Uh, pre meals would be 30 to 60 minutes before the game or training. And that's very important. Uh, usually, I give them uh, a little more than 60 minutes. That's for the basketball teams I work with, two hours before, and then during the one hour that they're in the locker room, we'll have uh, readily carbo-rich foods available like peanut butter, bread, bananas, etc., and ad libitum of, of a sports trip. During, and yes, it's usually training to two, three hours, okay? Uh, you have to provide some nutrient and so, Definitely hydration during these games, something that uh, Commissioner Norman and I never had the benefit of because usually right now, I think football is at the very top of, of at least hydrating their athletes because uh, it, it, the FIFA has ruled for football games. They actually have water breaks even during a game, depending on the temperature of the field during that time. And then the post, which I think is most important, the post meal is very important because it has to be within the first 45 minutes. That's when absorption is best. And this is across the board, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, and especially uh, your hydration. Uh, lately, uh, ang nao uso is a chocolate, is a chocolate drink right after a basketball game or a football game. Now, these are the things you have to consider when you're in sports now. Uh, even for the past five years, past four years, sports participation has changed. One, you have younger people in sports, and you have to consider that usually younger people have different uh, needs from your mature people. And then you have the older people. You have 60-year-olds biking, running triathlons, playing ice hockey playing cricket, and you have to cater to them too. Their nutrition needs will be different. Their strength and conditioning needs are different. And the third population, which is very special in anything, in the lang sports, uh, in anything special sila, are women. The, their biology is different. Their injury patterns are different. So if you're handling women athletes, as much as I hate to say it, their psychology is different. And the thing with women is their psychology is, is okay, this is a misogynic, misogynic, misogynistic comment. Their mental state is sometimes related to their hormonal state, unfortunately. No, but uh, hopefully, now that's a joke. Now, hopefully uh, that doesn't uh, affect too much our athletes. However, and this is true, their hormonal state affects their injury state. What has been proven over time is when women approach their ovulation period, that's when their joints get lax, that's when their heart muscles are weakest, and that's when their tendons are weakest. 
So around ovulation, dun sila na injure. Uh, there have been certain studies that have proven that. If you get around that, uh, then good for you. In fact, one of the problems now in, in, in controlling doping in sports is when uh, for women, uh, there is hormonal manipulation. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's an unethical edge that you're giving to women when you do hormonal manipulation to increase their strength and to prevent their injury. Another thing you have to consider now if you're going to sports science and, 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 and coaching is we have a lot of new sports. Like I said earlier, uh, they showed films in our national anthem on, on skateboarding. Who would have thought skateboarding would be a sport? Now you, see, you saw my shirt and the president of surfing. Surfing now is an Olympic sport. And when I formed the association in 2005, I only formed it to help people. Now in 2016, it became an Olympic sport. Suddenly people started to talk to me, wait, POC, it's an Olympic sport. Now we have to deal with funding. We have to deal with liquidation. Uh, liquidation, PSE, please, please note, we have to deal with liquidation just to keep the sport rolling. And you have to know the differences of these new sports. Like in, in my case, my athletes, my surfers never went into strength and conditioning before. So we went to our first World Surf Games, we realized Napakahina ng surfers natin. Sure, they'll be fine on the first two, three, four, five waves. But when they get to the next level, pagod na sila. So we've added, and the Philippine Sports Commission has been very helpful in the strength and condition of our athletes. And I think it paid off in the last Southeast Asian Games. Uh, actually, within one year, uh, we jumped uh, as a team. It, within one year of uh, attending the World Surf Games, because we instituted uh, strength and conditioning, some nutrition, uh, we jumped a couple of places uh, from number 20 in the world. I think now we could be around number 14 or 15 in the world. And we have, because of the COVID situation, we have a very, very small window that we might be able to qualify uh, one of our uh, male athletes in, in the Tokyo. But that's a wait and see. Now in my field, arthroscopy, there are new surgical techniques, there are new arthroscopic techniques. These change constantly. So you have to know the doctor who does this. You have to be very careful on doctors who do this. Uh, the understanding of injuries and treatment is very difficult, different now from then. Uh, I found out that uh, there's some things that we were doing then and some things are still being done now but basically our voodoo and very commercial in, in, in character that is just made to make money, but not really helping our athletes. And then the important thing now is this fine line between what we call biologics in treating injuries. Now, biologics, yan yun yung naririnig yung platelet rich plasma, uh, stem cell, mesenchymal cells. These are coming into field. Take it from me. It's still a new field, although PRP has been ar around since 2005. There's still no definite uh, rules and, and, and understanding on how they work. Sometimes it's just anecdotal. Sometimes they do work. Uh, I'll, I'll be a little more uh, specific. Of surfing, I think we have a very good, uh, we have a very good chance in in Asia, we're probably number two or three or sometimes number one, depending if it's longboard or shortboard. And this came out in the last Southeast Asian Games. Uh, we were able to put uh, surfing in the Southeast Asian Games. And because of that, and because of this, uh, when we, let, like I said, in the second World Surf Games, we improved drastically. And uh, now the ISA has its eyes on this particular athlete, see Mark Tokong. Mark Tokong right now is, is stranded in Australia. He won a couple of WSL le leagues uh, legs in Shergao for a couple of years. So he's always been in the eye of, of ISA. He's in Australia and PSC has been very generous in, in supporting some of his events there. And because of that, he's been invited to higher levels of the World Surf uh, 
WSL. And he is the guy I'm saying, if we treat it right and we have the right waves and we have the right attitude, he is an outside chance of, of uh, getting to the, if you're going into sport, remember the sport will not make you fit. When you're dealing with your athletes, you have to be fit for the sport. You have to go to the physical fitness factors, endurance, flexibility, strength, power, agility. Now, with these five uh, factors or sports, iba-iba na ang pag-improve uh, nila. How you used to do endurance in 2000 is different from how you do endurance in specific sports in 2020. The same with flexibility. Example natin of flexibility. Dati, nung athlete ako, we, call what, we, we do the flexibility, what we call the ballistic, no? yung jumping jacks, yung bouncing around, and then it became the static stretches, and now ang uso is functional stretches. And if you're working on flexibility, ang uso ngayon, you do the flexibility after the workout or after the, the game. Because ang, ang reasoning dyan, if you stretch when your muscles are not warm, you actually make them weaker and you stress the musculotendinous junction. Now you can try that. Lahat tayo nakaupo ngayon, bend down and touch your toes, uh, put your toes towards you, mapapansin nyo yung stretch dun sa Achilles tendon na naka-attach sa heel nyo. Now, if you work out, warm your muscles, and do the same stretch, you will feel the stretch actually go to your muscles. So the flexibility exercise won't stress your musculotendinous junction. That's why even when you're treating a tendinitis, you don't stretch the musculotendinous junction. You stretch the muscle then. Same with strength. No, Now they're very specific. Uh, uh, my... my Personal point of view, and it's very opinionated, some of the strength exercises being used now by strength and conditioning coaches are not really, we're not designed for strength training. Uh, uh, I emphasize on burpees and I emphasize on uh, deadlifts. Okay, I feel those two were for warm up or the uh, burpees naman sa seal team na kuha yun eh, for institution of of discipline. So putting many, many the burpees will not actually benefit you strength-wise. It might just give you some overuse injuries. Uh, adding a lot of weight in your deadlift, unless you're going to compete in a deadlift competition, will just uh, make you probably injure your back or make you more prone to back injury. Power, and this is where uh, eccentric training goes, your plyometrics, I might have my own personal preferences in that. I don't do, I, I don't suggest doing plyometrics to somebody below 15 or 16 years old because they don't have the hormones, they don't have the anatomy to benefit from an eccentric power, uh, eccentric strengthening program. Okay, they gain strength by doing the right technique, by uh, proper muscle recruitment. But if you put an eccentric strengthening in there, my injured lung sila. You have to have them when they have good testosterone uh, input, which is above 16, and they're more pubescent, or they're, when they're more adult, or they're more mature. And then agility and proprioception, I feel is very important. Even when I do uh, surgeries, and, and I think a lot of doctors forget this part, that's why it takes a little longer for their athletes to come in, is they have to work on agility and proprioception early on into the rehab. So again, these are just my thoughts. Uh, read on them, decide for yourself which ones will work for you. But all these physical fitness parameters right now have science into them. Don't all right, thank you very much for that very informative summary of the Philippine sports scene and uh, sports success, Dr. Canlas. I'm sure everyone learned a lot. But if you would allow me, I would like to re-emphasize some of the things that I've picked up in your extensive talk. First, over the years, the sports scene in our country has changed so much, which I believe is really good. It takes so much to get that gold medal. It may take years and a lot of effort. 
Athletes are born, but you will have to make them great. So choose your athletes to a good talent and identification program like the one we have in TST. And in order for you to make great athletes, you have to be able to choose them well. Next, you have to expose yourself to good, credible information for your own or your own athlete's improvements. Science has improved so much and we should utilize all the resources, studies, gadgets, and all the science we have learned to improve the athlete's performance and minimize injuries. Next, nutrition plays a very important role in athlete performance. However, vitamins and supplements may actually not be necessary if your athletes have very good nutritional intake. We have the Philippine Sports Commission Nutritional Unit to help us with this. Now, there are different folks, different strokes rather, for different folks. So tailor fit everything for each athlete and for each sport. You have to know the, the science, know what is new in science, but you also have to know what is good and what is bad, and do not rely on anecdotes. Sudden cardiac death in athletes have to be emphasized. We need to know about this, and we have to be able to prevent it. And okay, the, the way I treat my athletes is we, you have to have a very good uh, on-court, uh, on-site on coverage team. And... If you're capable of having a, on a team doctor, that would team uh, physical therapist, that would be good. Uh, I would say 80% of injuries or even 90% of injuries during, during a game can be treated initially on court. Uh, very few will have to be rushed to the hospital. So if you have a good on-site coverage, medical coverage team, or even a good team health worker, that would be good. Uh, there's no law, and I, uh, legislation will be very difficult. Uh, case in point, there was a move recently na, na to ban the youth from martial arts, and they tried to make that into law. And, and the specific sports organizations, NSAs, made it a point. And I think if you want that, we can we probably have a hard time with the law, but you can have, go to the specific national sports association to require like there's this new volleyball federation which i'm involved with and we're what we do is we will uh license all the physical therapists and the doctors in that uh and that teams involved and like the pba although it's an unwritten rule every team should have a physical therapist it should be through the uh, sports association rather than the law i think that's easier that Uh, for for the gifted ones, and if they're not into a uh, into a pivoting sport, like a triathlon is not a pivoting sport. Some of them do, but if you're into a pivoting sport, uh, it's, it's surgical, definitely surgical. Another question from Ray. Uh, okay, uh, this was a misnomer before, no? Um, sports medicine, hindi lang surgical yan, ah. Um, sports medicine, may physiology, like uh, joy rest, may nutrition. Uh, it, it, they're different. Uh, cardiology, I think, is, is a very important part of sports medicine. In fact, my colleague in, in FIBA is an outstanding cardiologist. Uh, any field... Any medical field, any health worker field, physical therapists to me are very important in sports science and sports medicine. Strength and conditioning coaches are very important on where you're happiest in. And we can always find a field for you that will be involved in sports sciences.